Replacement windows. Not in your budget this year? Well, what if you could save 20% renewal by Anderson? Full service replacement window division of Anderson are putting windows back in your budget with this exclusive podcast only offer. You know how much I love this and what a difference it makes. You owe it to yourself, people. You save 20% on windows, 20% on patio doors, an additional 20 bucks on every window. Don't settle for low-end vinyl windows. Renewal by Anderson's composite Fibrex window material is two times stronger than vinyl. And you can save 20% on windows and patio doors, plus an additional 20 bucks off each and every window with zero down, zero payments, and zero interest for a year. The air conditioning works better. It's so much quieter. The heater's better. Everything is better. Dust is down. So for free renewal by Anderson Windows Diagnosis, call 1-800-406-8700. Again, 1-800-406-8700. 1-800-406-8700. Dawson. Offer not available in all areas. Restrictions and conditions apply. Call for license information. TCL is a proud sponsor of the 1500 ESPN Studios. TCL, America's fastest growing TV brand. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed saying touch them all. Way back and gone. Touch them all, Joe Maurer. And now these guys are making it relevant to this year's twins. Now our two resident hardball nerds will attempt to touch them all on the week's news surrounding the twins in MLB. Here's Phil Mackey and Derek Wetmore. All right, welcome to an emergency episode of the Touch Em All podcast. I'm Derek Wetmore along with Phil Mackey and special guest Judd Zolgad. Guys, the twins have a manager. Rocco Baldelli, 37 years of age, takes over as the next manager of the Minnesota Twins. What do you think? Uh, I think I think Judd feels old because he's now older than the Twins manager by a decade. Not just older, but by a decade. Okay, well, let's straighten something out right away here. On Twitter this morning, I saw this, right? This is the first time that, that the Twins manager has exceeded my or been younger than me, and I don't get it. Derek Falvey was like 12. Yes. So when Derek Falvey got the job, folks, don't feel old. <laughs> If you were going to feel old, go back to when Falvey got the job because that that's yeah. truly when I said, I mean, that's a chief executive at that age. Come on. You know, it's amazing to me, guys, how I, I'm the youngest one in the room here, how quickly that feeling fled for me that I was like, you know, the first time you cover an athlete and you're like, oh, my gosh, this guy's a superstar and he's two years younger than I am. Gosh, I'm old. And that is over basically overnight. You can't you can't continue feeling you don't cover sports for long enough or follow sports for long enough and still feel that way. So I don't know what the guy I can't even remember the athlete. Maybe you guys remember. We'll get into Rocco Baldelli and if we think it's a good hire, bad hire for the Twins and all that. I don't remember the athlete for whom I dis, I decided that I was old, but it was like the very next one that I decided. Oh yeah, like we're all gonna die someday, yeah. anyways. I think for for me, it's more the year that they were born. I think about not 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 sure. how old are they now, but wait a second. The Twins just drafted a dude who was born in the 2000s right, or whatever. Right. Like yeah. That's what makes me... He doesn't I, know what Y2K yeah. is because he was two years <laughs> too young. Yes. Uh, so what? I know Judd's been doing some digging over here, and and, and we've heard Rocco Baldelli's name. About what, what do we know about Rocco Baldelli? Let's just go around the room. I know he was one of the more exciting players to watch for two or three years, and then injuries derailed him, and, and he winds up out of baseball at the age of 28 as a player, and yeah. then has this fast-rising... Coach slash front office of, right. uh, and it was exclusively with the Rays, correct? I think he went. I think he attempted a comeback with the Red Sox. I mean, like as a as a but behind as the a scenes good, guy. Oh yes, yep, yeah, yep. and and the story was because he he was a rising good player, signed I think a pretty good contract with the Rays, long term deal in two thousand five, and then in two thousand seven, like strained a hamstring, and he didn't recover. And yeah. he was really fatigued, and, and it turned into what I've seen described now as a mysterious illness no. that eventually derailed him. I think the Rays hired him. He tried to come back. Yeah. But he went from being a guy who was perceived as a potential star, I think, to being done pretty quickly. Right. Well, he was in that 
sort of Evan Longoria wave with Tampa. This is just from memory. I, I'll have to do a lot more digging on this as the day unfolds and as we get to meet Rocco later this afternoon. But, yeah, from my understanding, he was one of the top prospects in all of baseball. I was like sixth overall pick yeah. by the Rays in 2000 or something like that. And then several years later, multiple injuries, and then Judd's right, the, there was a soft tissue injury that just he was not the same afterwards. And it was... The way I understand it was diagnosed as a mitochondrial dysfunction, which basically means his cells are not capable of producing the energy that you need to, yeah, compete as a professional athlete. You just wanted to say mitochondrial. That was very good, by I the way. I thought about that titling the quick. podcast yeah. mitochondrial, yes. Yeah, but it's pretty good. It, to me, look, the, the fact that he was a star player, this actually segues great into a point that I, th- I think this is a good hire for the Twins, and I'll tell you why. He was a rising star player who sort of fairly or unfairly if you if you characterize it this way it was taken away from him and 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 for the record he was a few years before the Longoria David Price crew he was one of the first big young players that came in when the Rays were still terrible from like 2004 through well and then he was so banged up and had the issues the was it mitochondrial the word that you used and he was he was still trying to he was still trying to fire it up when the Rays became World Series relevant, but yep. that was sort of the end for him. Yeah, yeah. So 2008 was their World Series year, and Longoria was drafted only a few years before that. So I want to say Baldelli was sort of on the scene as that wave of prospects was coming up. And to me, I think that's really, really important for this role. Not to say that Paul Molitor, a guy who I've got a ton of respect for, not to say that he couldn't connect with young players, but Paul Molitor was last a star player when I was in diapers. That maybe says more about me than Paul Molitor, but Rocco Baldelli hmm. is was like much, two years ago, though, right? much closer to. I mean, but you corrected the problem, so don't get me wrong. Adult I admire diapers. you greatly. That's right. That's right. Derek Wetmore here for the adult diaper. Yeah, <laughs> depends. <laughs> depends where you at. We need to sponsor this podcast. If I'm at Target Field and I gotta go, hey. So the way I think about it is, one of the things that we heard them say last month, right, was what do they need? Someone to connect with young players and help them develop that was part of Rocco Baldelli's job with the Rays was sort of major league player development he was called like the field coordinator and I think they probably just had to pick a name for the job what I understand is he helped them oh you get to the big leagues Blake Snell and not to specifically credit him for that guy but how do you continue to get better despite the fact that you're not around the same training programs you are anymore yes so he's close enough in age and recent experience playing much like a guy like, say, Jeff Pickler, is very close in that you just finished your playing career, so you can connect on that level, but you're also swimming in the waters of analytics every single day for seven years as a front office member. I think that's a great mix for the Twins. Yeah, here's the funny thing. there's uh, The people who criticize analytics departments and spreadsheets are ruining baseball, and I, I, I do agree that length of game has gone bonkers because of analytics and working counts and you know, pitching, pitching changes, changes yeah. exactly. The, you know, pitching changes in the first inning after one batter. But we've kind of come full circle here. Judd and I talked about this on our radio show yesterday, and that it's now, we always look for the market of inefficiency in baseball, right? Moneyball pointed out that on-base percentage was the money ball, was the was the market inefficiency in the early 2000s. Uh, maybe it was outfield defense for a while. Right now, the market inefficiency is human communication. And it's, it's like we've come full circle. We spent right. 15 years in baseball trying to gather analytical information. Okay, who can get the best data when it comes to spin rates and exit velocity and ground ball rates and, and diving deep into sabermetrics? And now, in 2018, the teams, the, the, the information race is never going to end, but it's pretty equal. I mean, everyone has access to player tracking and... Spin rate. No secrets it's, now, basically, right? Yeah, I mean, if you if unless you're ignoring available information, oh, I mean, some do, teams are. Who would do for sure? Who would do that? Yeah, how the Twins did for a long time. Actually. I mean, that so, would never be yeah. done. But the Twins are no longer ignoring information. Right. The Twins have just as much information as almost anybody else. But now we've come so far down that path that being able to communicate the information to human beings, human beings who might not have gone to college, and human beings who might be nineteen, twenty years old in the minor leagues who don't even speak great English, communication. And and connecting information with an actual twenty three year old outfielder and and getting him to play at his ninetieth percentile is the market inefficiency and the twins deemed that Paul Molitor was not a great cog in that machine. 
I also think that this job now has changed so much in, in the last five years or so because if you think about that job for a long time, the GM hired the manager basically and then said, go to it, right? Yeah. You set the lineup. Yeah. I mean, GMs, based for a long time, once the season started, would go talk to the skipper if they had to make what? Some type of roster move or sure. something. But you did not see the the uh, the Levines and Falvies of the world back in the day go into that office every single day. Every day. They do now. Yes. And so, and this is not a bad thing, but I think where guys like Paul were, were probably like, probably had trouble adapting or adjusting is their whole life was seen, seeing a rock star, manager, crusty skippers run the show. And now it's basically like, no, it's all teamwork. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I do think, the important thing here, too, to Phil's point, is is if it's going to be teamwork, you've got to have people who can play off each other well. So if I'm the if I'm the chief baseball officer and I'm really good with analytics and facts, but perhaps I don't have the greatest people skills, well, then I need my manager to be able to go to, let's say, Byron Buxton and put his arm around Byron Buxton and say, it's going to be okay, and here's exactly why. Sure. So I do. I think that this has be. This used to be. I hire you. You run things. It's now. I hire you, and we all try to run things. Yeah, I think there's a very recent example of this, and and I haven't talked to the people involved in this, so this is my watching on a couch, watching on TV, watching Ryan Presley mow through batting orders as a relief ace for the Houston Astros. I think Presley is a great example of everyone has the same – unless the Astros know something more about spin rate than the Twins do, which, by the way, they don't. I've talked to a bunch of people with the Twins. They knew this Ryan Presley was in there. Yeah. For him to change so drastically when he goes to Houston, not just in terms of results but also in terms of process, hey, I'll throw the hook more because it's a really good curveball, why didn't that happen in Minnesota? I've wondered that basically since he became that relief ace. A.J. Hinch called him this postseason. According to the TBS broadcast, he said he's our Andrew Miller. Yeah. Well, you know who could have used an Andrew Miller? The Minnesota Twins. Well, and why didn't that happen? Oh, I actually have the quote from the Washington Post pulled up in front of us yeah. here from Ryan Presley. So, so Presley pitched 26 games with the Astros and had a .77 ERA. And it wasn't small sample size, flukish. His expected ERA wasn't a whole lot higher than that. He was just flat out one of the best relief pitchers in all of baseball for a two-month period with the Astros. And he said, somebody asked him from the Washington Post, how is this possible? You were really good with the Twins. And and the Astros would have taken the Twins version of you, but you then morphed into this untouchable reliever. And he said, honestly, it's the preparation of the Astros analytics department. They tell us what works and what's not going to work. The percentages, how you set up your mix of pitches, how to attack hitters. Every team has an analytics department, Presley said. And this is no knock on the Twins, but seeing the time the Astros put in and the scouting reports you're given, it's like, whoa, it's a different level. You kind of see, wow, if I just pitch a little more to this percentage instead of that percentage, I can have some better results. When I came over here to the Astros, they were like, look, your curveball is your best pitch. Everybody tells you your best pitch should be your fastball, but with the amount of spin you have on your curveball, you have to throw that more. It'll set up your fastball even more. Now, the Twins, like you just said, the Twins knew all of that. The Twins have been building the same systems behind the scenes. The Twins have the same information. And I guarantee you, the Twins wanted Ryan Presley to maximize his strengths even more. Yeah. But what was that gap? (laughs) Why did he pitch that well with the Ash? Is it because part of it might be validation of guys like Justin Verlander who can tell Ryan Presley, hey, these aren't just geeks walking around with clipboards and, and Surface Pro 4s. You should listen to these guys. They can take yeah. you to a new level. Yeah, Lance McCullers could say a thing or two about that based on his World Series performance last year. Mm-hmm. Having the World Series cred helps, too, obviously. But I love that Ryan Presley quote for for one reason and one reason alone. It's, that it's clear to me that there's a missed opportunity in Minnesota in that he already has the perfect Minnesota passive-aggressive down super pat. He says, this is not a knock on the Twins, but knock on not, the yeah, Twins, exactly. knock on the Twins. <laughs> it's great. It, it's What a missed opportunity. But to me, that quote is exactly right. And I don't know, boys, we don't know what's going to happen with the rest of the coaching staff. I would imagine some of the coaches will be retained. I'd be shocked if one or more are not let go because this is an indictment on Eddie Guardado. We love him around here. Famous twin, 
charismatic guy. Yeah. Basically, everybody that you talk to gets along with Eddie Guardado. That's but not if, the point, right? But if, if, if it's you're not here to be a nice guy. You're here to get Ryan Presley to perform like Andrew Miller. So I don't know what the coaching staff is going to look like, but I would say those quotes and his performance in Houston looks bad for Guardado. It looks bad for Paul Molitor, too, frankly. And now I think this is a really big opportunity for a guy like Rocco Baldelli to take over and sort of bridge that communication gap. And I, I think this all goes to, into when people said, well, Paul was such a nice guy. Why fire Paul? Paul – and I, I think Paul tried. I really do. This is – this is I saw nothing that said that Paul said, you know, get out, out of my office, you're wrong, blah, blah, blah. But I really do believe that, that when we talk about executives hiring their guy, th- this is why. Because it needs to fit. And mm-hmm. so Paul might have tried and been a, a nice guy. But at Paul's age and with Paul's experiences in his baseball life, they're they're not necessarily going to dovetail with what these two do. And so this goes to putting together a, an administration, basically, that is going to work from top on down, where everybody has, has the same thoughts and ideas, which is where I think the Astros are and where I think teams like the Twins are trying to get to but they're, they're not there yet. It's not that they don't have the information. Yeah. It's how do they have the proper channels in yeah. which everyone's on board with, this is why it makes perfect sense to do it this yeah. way. You're right. Yeah, I, I, I love this idea of of guys who aren't that long out of baseball. I mean, he Rocco Baldelli, has. I don't think he's played in the major leagues in the last nine years. So, But in terms of his age, I love the idea of someone who played recently and also understands, so understands – the ball guy stuff and the clubhouse stuff and has know, the just, stories. Right, right. But also understands the front office stuff. I mean, that's yeah. the perfect bridge. Yeah. You know, Glenn Perkins was always that. I know as a player, he would help explain things even to to us off microphone. And I, I think that that's and, and he would take players aside, too. But that's the type of bridge that you need. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't I don't want this to turn into a big Paul Molitor bash fest because I think Paul Molitor came a long way in that regard. and was very open minded. And it's really tough to pin everything on Paul Molitor, just like it's really tough to give full credit to a manager when a team breaks out. It's really hard to even quantify a manager's value. And let's be fair. The pressure is now on Falvey and Levine. Yeah, they have you, their guy now. Two years ago, you took over, and I I think I got a little turned up on a recent podcast, Phil. I probably chugged a little too much coffee. I heard the highlights going through Twitter the other day, and I thought, okay, that was maybe a little... Wetmore, you dialed it up. It, I said you sleepwalked your way through off season number one. You brought a you fastball. You bargain That's, shopped no, your off season you number two. <laughs> you were great. You were throwing the heat. It was just so not me. But like, okay, here's let's let's be honest about it. I, I think Falvey and Thad Levine are incredibly capable in their jobs. I also think the first two years, it's a bad look where they're at right now compared with where they were two years ago. Now. You've got your guy. You've got your young nucleus of players. Sure, the minor leagues look good, but Royce Lewis ain't helping you next year, so uh, ignore that for now. And some of the free agent acquisitions from last year were terrible. They just fell flat on their face. Um, You traded Ryan Presley, and he became a star in Houston. Now they're going to get to pay him an arbitration raise instead of you. Meanwhile, you have to go back on the market and fix your bullpen, which underperformed last year. So there's... There's a lot of good things that I could say about Derek Falvey and Thad Levine based on my personal experience, based on hearing from other people, and based on the approach that I think is the right one. And it's also fair to say that like, it hasn't got them to where they want to go now. Now the pressure's on. I've got two thoughts here because as fun as uh, 2017 was, it was such a pop-up. So like, if you put – if you say, well, you went to the playoffs in your first year, if you gave them truth – Serum, they would be like, that was the worst thing that could have happened because <laughs> because it was false. I mean, it was it was fun, mm-hmm. and Paul did a great job, but there is no way that those guys took a 103 loss team and said, you know what, I see a wild card here. So to judge them on that and to apply pressure off that to me is BS to a certain degree. Sure. Now, now where they need to get this right, and the and the strike against them for me is this the Buxton thing. Like, the Buxton thing to me was just handled terribly. I didn't like it. It reeked to me of not probably having the proper people skills that I would like to see people like that do have. Uh, But if you get Buxton and Sano right, 
if Baldelli can come in, and I don't know what, what he can do, but if he can work with them and get through to both of, of them, and getting through to both of them is going to take a very different skill set, but it's important, then yeah. it changes the, the course of things to me. So, I think you're right. But if people, if people look at that first year and say, well, you, you went to the playoffs, come on now. That was, that, was a, that was a really, really bad team that popped up. It was fun. But that should, that should not have applied pressure to their timetable. And I think they're smart, they're smart enough guys. They didn't see it that no. way. We saw it that no, way. No, I, ag- I agree with you. But it's just that if this is a scapegoat kind of hire – or firing, I should say, because Paul Molitor won manager of the year, which may be superficial, fine. Then you take such a drastic step backwards, in part because of the bad moves that you made last winter, then you fire the guy. That's fine. I don't think any of us took significant issue with moving on from Paul Molitor in year one out of three. That's fine. But now you've got your guy. You've got your sort of scapegoat. If even if you never make that excuse, other people are going to say, "Well, you know, they just they couldn't do what they wanted to do under Molitor." Well, yeah, but you also made some questionable moves that didn't work out, and here we are. I think the Twins are going to make a big jump in the standings this year, but I don't think it's because of Rocco Baldelli. I don't even necessarily think it's because of Byron Buxton or Miguel Sano. I think they're going to have a huge winter in terms of pursuing free agents and trades because. I can tell you that the roster is not going to look anything like what it looks like today when they report to Fort Myers in a couple months. And I, and I, and I, I think if they do make a big jump, adding free agents is going to play a role, but it will be Byron Buxton first and foremost, and then secondarily Miguel Sano. And Could if be. those guys do click, I will have to give some credit to Rocco Badelli if he's able to get through to them in, in a certain way that Paul Mollery didn't. When we come back here in just a second... There's another theme here that we should touch on. The Twins have exhibited this in their managerial search and in the way that they've laid out uh, their staff here the last couple of years. But Luther Brookdale Toyota is the proud sponsor, the one that goes back three years now on the Touch em All podcast, 694 and Brooklyn Boulevard, where uh, my family and I have been going for 30-plus years. And we've had great peace of mind knowing that we're not necessarily – the the most obsessed car people, especially me. So it's nice having a team that has your back at this brand new amazing facility that's only about six years old. Uh, you get the best combination. If I could use a dumb baseball metaphor of great front office, great personnel. And now you got the great facility. It would be like if the Rays had a new stadium that you didn't have to uh, you know travel across a bridge for two hours to get to. Six ninety four on Brooklyn Boulevard. Maybe they could have kept Rocco Baldelli. Who knows. 694 on Brooklyn Boulevard and LutherBrookdaleToyota.com. Replacement windows. Not in your budget this year? Well, what if you could save 20% renewal by Anderson? Full service replacement window division of Anderson are putting windows back in your budget with this exclusive podcast only offer. You know how much I love this and what a difference it makes. You owe it to yourself, people. You save 20% on windows, 20% on patio doors, an additional 20 bucks on every window. Don't settle for low-end vinyl windows. Renewal by Anderson's composite Fibrex window material is two times stronger than vinyl. And you can save 20% on windows and patio doors, plus an additional 20 bucks off each and every window with zero down, Zero payments and zero interest for a year. The air conditioning works better. It's so much quieter. The heater's better. Everything is better. Dust is down. So for a free renewal by Anderson Windows Diagnosis, call 1-800-406-8700. Again, 1-800-406-8700. 1-800-406-8700. Dawson. Offer not available in all areas. Restrictions and conditions apply. Call for license information. All right, so if you guys notice a pattern with the Twins, it's well, there's two different patterns. Number one, they uh, continue to poach from the Rays pipeline of smart people. Josh Kalk, the behind-the-scenes pitching guru, who had a Pitch FX blog site 10 years ago or 12 years ago, and the Rays made him shut that down. They hired yeah. him full-time, and he he gets a lot of credit behind the scenes in Tampa for setting up some of their pitching systems, and helping some of their young pitchers thrive. So they've definitely, with Baldelli and Kalk and uh, Derek Shelton spent some yep. time with the Rays too. So there's there's guys that they're plucking from Tampa. And, and even in their managerial search, they're looking at the Cubs pipeline, the Astros pipeline. 
So they're they're definitely going to some of the smartest forward thinking organizations and saying who are the main people that help run your operation, who generate the best ideas, and let's bring them in for interviews or just flat out hire them. Uh, hire them. The thing you're going to have to figure out though is are you hiring based on proximity to success? Are you hiring somebody who was a part of something successful, or are you hiring somebody that was a reason for why it was successful. Right. And you know, and, and maybe you, you just don't know a hundred percent until you get two or three years with a guy with a guy like Rocco Bedelli. Well you, what you bring up is a really worthwhile point because that's the case <laughs> Thank in you. any I know. Yeah. Yeah, great. Know. Pat yourself on the back. Yeah. Don't put yourself you on just a 10-day DL you, you, straining you your up, shoulder. You set muscles. him up to do that, Derek. Such a great, and then he did such it. a great point. So great question. There is this amount of proximity versus cause. Derek Falvey was of this. Hey, the Indians are smart, forward-thinking. They developed Corey Kluber into an ace when no one really thought he was going to be. They they took, you know, Andrew Miller. They just raised the bar for all of their pitchers across the organization. At least that's a perception. My question at the time was like, cool, that's, yeah, that's exactly the kind of guy you should hire. Was Falvey the one responsible for that, or was he just in the room when that stuff happened? And I think, just based on my experience talking with Falvey over the past two years, I think he's a reason why that happened in Cleveland. So I almost thought, based on some of the answers at the press conference a month ago, they were going to hire somebody from Texas or from Cleveland because that's when you can know, hey, this is the guy who was really pushing this forward. This doesn't happen without fill in the blank. And if you don't have that firsthand personal experience, you really have to trust your relationships that other teams aren't going to be lying to you about, oh, yeah, no, this guy was in the room, and he was just sort of there. I don't know. I don't have enough background on Rocco Baldelli to know if he was a, a driver for things like the opener, things like trading great players like Corey Dickerson on a cheap contract and still winning 90 games. Yeah, you, you just hit on the opener. If if you're a Twins fan, if you're our friend Patrick James Royce, and you're annoyed by relief pitchers coming in for five pitches, it's here to it's stay, baby. Absolutely here to stay now. Opening the, the, day opener. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. Right. No. March March thirtieth. We're gonna get an opener. No, because Patrick Corbin won't need an opener before his first wow. start for the Twins. But I do think that there is this like proximity question that needs to be answered, and there are only two ways you can really do it. Well, three, I guess. The first would be know the guy. You worked in the trenches with him. Derek, for example, in Cleveland, you know this is a forward-thinking, smart person who questions everything and wants evidence-based decisions, right? That's one. Two, and this is sort of where I think of Thad Levine's role as being critically important to this, contacts throughout the game that you trust to not blow smoke. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're considering this guy as a hire. It would be a forward step for him, so good for his career. Is someone in the Rays organization going to give you the glowing review that says, yeah, poach a guy who we think is super valuable to us? Maybe, but, but maybe not. So that's the second way you can do it. The third, just hire somebody and cross your fingers. Yeah, well, just, just hope. Who was the, there was a college football team, I think it was a just, MAC team, that hired. They went and said, okay, who, what's the best offense in the Pac-12 and who's the offensive coordinator? And let's go hire that guy. Okay. And they just and someone who just got fired recently. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a strategy, though. All right. Uh, well, the Astros are the best team, so let's just literally hire Who's anybody from charge. the Astros. Yeah. <laughs> well, you better vet that out pretty significantly yeah. because that person might have just been there when A.J. Hinch pushed I everything think across a, the goal line. I think it's it's partially a guessing game, but, but I think it's done probably pretty strategically, and it, it's why it's why now you talk to a 1,000 people. Yes. Because I think I think these guys do two things. One is, I and it's smart, I think they steal a lot. So, like, if they sit down, I don't necessarily believe that they go they go talk to a guy because they, they think that he's going to be a great candidate for this job. I think they talk to him to meticulously take notes and say, he just had three decent ideas. Sure. Oh, for sure. I also, I also think that in the time that you do that, you can start to get a read on, on a person and be like, this person's full of crap. This person is clearly sure. in the room but doesn't know. Sure. But this person does. Yep. But, you know, I've, I've been told that Falvey and – Levine will talk to people way down the way down the spectrum of oh, things, yeah. and actually, when, when they're done, take notes. Oh yeah. So I mean, these guys, and it might be brilliant, it might not be. I don't know, but these guys definitely are meticulous, and so I think they probably have a pretty good feel in their own ability to suss out 
these three people are really good and know what they're doing, and these three are – they think they're good and they're full of it. Yeah, and one of the most important things is making sure that you can you're, – you're not going to outspend – the Dodgers. You're not going to outspend the Red Sox and the Yankees. You're not. You're not going to just go into free agency and say, "Well, all right. Well, our pipeline sucks, so let's go spend two hundred million dollars." I know there's a lot of Twins fans. I don't think we get a lot of the 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 Polads are cheap crew on this podcast necessarily. But um, if if your mindset is, "Why don't they just go spend two hundred million dollars?" It's not going to happen. The salary cap. Uh, the lack of a salary cap is what actually empowers the biggest markets to outspend because they have more chips at the poker table. So really, the Twins are a lot more like the Rays yeah. than they are like the Yankees. Yeah. So the fact that they're looking closely at what Tampa's doing and what and what Cleveland was doing, bringing in Derek Falvey, those small and mid-market teams and the way in which they're able to find little edges here and there, 1% there. There was a, there was a book once written about the Tampa Bay Rays by Jonah Carey called The Extra 2%. Mm-hmm. All right, if we're not going to go outspend for that free agent pitcher, mm-hmm. how can we maybe come around at a different angle and get an edge on these other teams, something they might not be thinking about? That's the playing field in which the Twins have to focus on, and it seems like they have, even though the results haven't been great on the field. So bad look for the Twins. The Rockies won 91 games. The A's won 97 games. The Rays won 90 games. These are the teams that you're sort of in that same ballpark with. Milwaukee was knocking on the door of the freaking World Series. Mm-hmm. Now, they added an M- NL MVP, so that helps quite a bit. But well, they, they also developed a candidate for sure. Cy Young and they, Josh Hader, right? They were super similar a year ago, the Twins and Brewers. And then the Brewers went out and just flat out had a better offseason, made it almost all the way to the World Series. Mm-hmm. But you, you can be Houston, right? If you look at I it, I think so. And and if you are if you are right there and you've got a good pipeline and can make a trade for a big name, that's great. But I think it's a fallacy to say, well, just go spend, because if you're a team that just goes and spends and spends and spends, but does not develop players in 2018, you're not successful. Yeah, you need I mean, 25 Boston's guys. Done a great job too. Yep. So you've done so. So your your core needs to be a Buxton Sano, and then if you get hot and you get good. Go trade a prospect for a, a big name player potentially, mm-hmm. but any belief that you can go out now in January and fix things immediately mm-hmm. is just not true now. Yeah, baseball truly is one through twenty five on your roster. In the NBA, you can take a team of scrubs and put LeBron James on it, and boom, you go from twenty five to fifty wins. Conference finals <laughs> because one player has so much influence. One player can literally have the ball on every possession, but in yeah. baseball. The possessions, quote unquote, are spread out. You only the the worst hitter in your lineup gets the same number of plate appearances in a game for the most part as the best hitter in your lineup. So if you're not, if you think you can take a broken team and just go sign fifteen free, oh, you can sign Machado. fifteen free agents. Mackie wants Machado. Don't forget well, that Mach- Machado in 2019. I've got a Machado new hot was the Mackie slogan. Machado would help. Yeah, got a new hot take. But even guys. even a Manny Machado. Or let's let's use Mike Trout. Mike Trout's the best player in baseball. Mike Trout is already a Hall of Fame player. Like if he retired right now, he yep. would get Hall of Fame consideration if He'd not be in, in right. Yep. And he's, what is he, 27, 28 years old. He's ridiculous. See, don't you feel a little old now? Like, just a little? I'm told he's boring, so (laughs) I can care less. But if you put Mike Trout on the free agency market right now and added him to one of the worst teams in baseball, let's pick a team. Let's say you added him to the Kansas City Royals. The Royals wouldn't go from... 60 wins to to 90 wins. No. They'd go from like 60 wins to you know 70, 70 wins, yeah, right? Probably. And then, okay, well, what else are you going to do? Are you going to go sign four other free agents? Because right. there's not four other Mike Trouts out there. Right. So I think this is, hey, this is before the press conference Thursday. The Rocco Baldelli news just came down without having dug a ton into his background, just the little I know about him and where he came from and what he represents. I think it's a good hire for the Twins. Judd, good hire, bad hire? Uh. Specifically in him, I don't know, but I think the fact that these guys got their guy is very important. Sure. I think that I think for pe- people that say, "Well, it's Bush League to fire Paul." No, I do think that these guys, if these guys are going to be given a chance to have pressure on them and be successful, yeah. I think getting their guy becomes extremely mm-hmm. important. It's a good hire, or if I could phrase it differently, it's the it's the right type of hire. Sure. They're they're thinking about the right things when they hire Rocco Badelli. Yeah, well, we'll see what comes out of the press conference. I'm sure we'll have plenty more to talk about after that. Thanks, uh, boys. This is fun. Yeah, appreciate you coming on, Judd. We uh, actually took this to Judd. We took we, we Judd was prepping in the prep room, and we literally can took we this to about to drop yeah. a big column. Zolgad colon. You don't know what's coming next. Whenever Judd starts a sentence with "I'm about to drop a big," I don't want to hear the rest of it. 
Well, if you think your your column is going to be a hot take, I I might have to one up you in the coming days. Phil thinks Manny Machado, 2019, and he also says Byron Buxton will be a huge help to the Twins. I think the biggest deal for the Twins in 2019 will be Bryce Harper's bat. Wow. Replacement windows. Not in your budget this year? Well, what if you could save 20% renewal by Anderson? Full service replacement window division of Anderson are putting windows back in your budget with this exclusive podcast only offer. You know much I love this and what a difference it makes. You owe it to yourself, people. You save 20% on windows, 20% on patio doors, an additional 20 bucks on every window. Don't settle for low-end vinyl windows. Renewal by Anderson's composite Fibrex window material is two times stronger than vinyl. And you can save 20% on windows and patio doors, plus an additional 20 bucks off each and every window with zero down, zero payments, and zero interest for a year. The air conditioning works better. It's so much quieter. The heater is better. Everything is better. Dust is down. So for a free renewal by Anderson Windows Diagnosis, call 1-800-406-8700. Again, 1-800-406-8700. 1-800-406-8700. Dawson. Offer not available in all areas. Restrictions and conditions apply. Call for license information. I'm Rita Foley with an AP News Minute. The NYPD has found another device after several bombs were found yesterday addressed to prominent Democrats and CNN. This latest device, taken from a building associated with the actor Robert De Niro, we're told, and it appears to be linked to the others we are hearing. Robert De Niro has been a frequent critic of President Trump. Senior FBI profiler Mary Ellen O'Toole on how the feds can catch this person. I think with a device like this plus the packaging, there's the potential for DNA and fingerprints Mm -hmm. um, and trace evidence. She tells CBS this morning this person is probably enjoying all the attention. My sense is that um, the sense of power and control and omnipotence that he's getting out of really being the center of attention now throughout the country is, is probably like a narcotic for him. Mary Ellen O'Toole, a former FBI profiler. I'm Rita Foley.